thanks for joining our webinar. I'm going to turn this over to Tom Peters now from ZY Solutions. Thank you for joining today. Our webinar, Benefits of Real-Time Visual Data Analysis for Corporate Environments, is being presented to you today by ZY Vision in conjunction with Panopticon. So my name is Tom Peters. I'm the CTO for ZY Solutions. I have over 25 years of experience in helping companies build uh, business intelligence solutions, including architecting data warehouses, managing those databases, as well as uh, the ETL process and the BI presentation tool. Also on our call today is David Fretwell, who is the CEO of ZY Solutions. He'll actually be giving the product demonstration today. He's a co-founder of ZY Solutions in 1997. He also has over 25 years of uh, business experience. So David can bring you some real-life world examples of uh, business use cases and how to deploy these solutions in a, a real-life business environment. A little bit about ZY Solutions. We were founded in 1997. We're a privately held corporation headquarters here in Chicago. And we work with partners such as Panopticon to bring you best of breed solutions for all a company's BI needs. I'm Hugh Heinsen, and I'm the Vice President of Marketing at Panopticon. I've been working with image processing systems and ERP systems for about 20 years. Panopticon has been around for about 12 years. We actually started as an outgrowth of an emerging markets brokerage. And we specialize in data visualization tools for real-time data. What that means is we can connect to real-time feeds from a variety of sources, including message buses like Cupid or Apache. We can also connect to CEP engines like Sybase Alary. Our clients include some very large names, uh, mostly large companies, but also a lot of small ones. We can't name all our clients, but some of them are, are listed there on this slide. Our products are actually in the fifth generation right now, and we support both .NET and Java IT environments. What we are is visual data analysis software. And what that allows you to do is very quickly analyze very large, fast-changing data sets. So when you have time-critical data, and you need to make business decisions based on that time-critical data, we have a good solution for that because essentially what we provide is the ability to make an insightful, informed decision in much less time than is normally possible using traditional reports. We have an OLAP cube embedded in all our products. It's actually an in-memory stream cube. Uh, we call it a stream cube. And the, all the data is processed through that stream cube, and that enables on-the-fly slicing and dicing of the data. You can change hierarchies. You're going to see some of that here in this demo. Uh, we do not store the data. We're not a data warehouse. We're not a database. Uh, we connect to external data sources like relational databases, like real-time feeds, and then we process it through an in-memory OLAP cube, but we don't store the data in our own system. So there are many different ways you can deploy your BI applications. It, it, depicted here, we have one scenario for a... Uh, a typical BI application. The bottom three really dealing with the data portion of that and the top three dealing with the presentation of that data. Now in many environments what you may do is go directly against your operational data sources. Uh, in some environments it may be beneficial to actually merge them up into a data warehouse. You choose depending on your deployment which way is best suited for you. Um, Many companies already have some type of BEI uh, solution in place today, but what we find is there's weaknesses in a very distinct area, and that's with the con consumption of large data sets and trying to uh, gain insight into that data. Now, while your typical BI applications will have some type of ad hoc query analysis, uh, BI reporting, your typical grid graph type of presentations, uh, they do very well at then they may have some area where they do dashboards and visualizations, but they typically are very weak in this area. And this is where Panopticon can augment that existing application that you may have or stand alone by itself, whether that's going directly against the operational data source or going against the data warehouse. With its real-time monitoring analysis and its ability to really uh, derive information from your data warehouse or data sources, Panopticon, as you'll see throughout the demo, has a visualization that helps you glean those outliers and different trends and uh, groupings that you cannot otherwise do with other products. And then, of course, you have predictive analytics and data mining area. 
So the point here is that Panopticon really lays in the area of dashboards and visualizations and does so at a very high level that other products typically don't meet. Your typical data analysis, you have a lot of questions. What are those performing outliners or in or outside of a particular category? What's inside or outside? Uh, what type of performance are we getting? Uniform, they're not uniform. What are the outliers? Is there any kind of trend or clustering? And when you typically look at a data set, these are very hard questions to answer by weeding through volumes and volumes of data. So what Panopticon does is it takes those large data sets, those time sensitive data sets, that you can't typically gleam information out of. So for instance, you have a, uh, uh, an Excel spreadsheet here. It has tons of columns in it. It has numerous rows. And if you just look at this data, you just can't gleam any trends or any outliers from just the numbers themselves. Not only because of the sheer volume of data, but because of the limited short-term memory that the human mind has. So if you had a good tool, the right tool, you can easily adapt to those changing conditions and identify those outliers. You can very easily see aggregated information and drill down into the most important details. You'd be able to display that data through an interactive high volume real-time visualization so you can see things as they happen uh, and be proactive to that. And you can join the disparate sources together. So I could join things from my different operational data sources, even if they weren't in a data warehouse, and merge them together to get a holistic view of everything that's going on. And Panopticon does this through visual encoding. If you take your typical uh, spreadsheet again and you look at those volumes of data, you can't really derive anything out of that. But by putting colors and shapes and groupings around them, I could very quickly identify that, for instance, I have a large blue area. Well, that tells me that everything's going good in this area. I have a large red area. That tells me everything's going bad in that area. And then I can drill down into that visually and help uh, analyze this data much quicker and much faster. Rapid understanding of that data through efficient visual design is what Panopticon is all about. One way it does this is through a tree maps. Now, tree maps uses size, color, and groupings to very quickly derive this information, as I mentioned previously. So if we look at the uh, tree map here on the right, we very quickly, our eye goes and focuses on those crucial outliers based upon color, shape, and size. So very quickly, I can see I have an area here in London that's pink. And I can see here that there's uh, an area that's even darker pink and dark red. And that dark red is what's making the aggregate London out of sync or out of the outlier. I could very quickly see Frankfurt's blue, and there's only a few areas that I have to be concerned with because they're in pink. So through this visual encoding, I can see the hierarchical relationships. I can very quickly comprehend the data and very quickly see what the crucial outliers are and go in there and look at the specific details that are making the aggregate higher level out of sync. Now, horizon graphs are something special from Panopticon. We're actually the only provider of horizon graphs. We invented this a few years ago. And one of the problems that a number of our clients were having was they, they wanted to be able to compare trends for historical data across time, and they wanted to be able to compare a number of data sets simultaneously. Now, the traditional way to do that is with a line graph, and line graphs are, are very, very useful and, and completely intuitive. Everybody understands them. However, you have a serious occlusion problem when you have a lot of data sets. And, and here we have an example of that on the screen. As you can see, there's so many uh, lines on the screen that even with color coding, you can't make sense of it. It's very difficult to, to really interpret this in any effective way because there's just too many lines. So you can't really make any sense of are there correlations uh, in the performance of various uh, the different sets? Uh, are there divergences? Well, what's really happening here, it's, it's really impossible to tell because of the occlusion problem. What happens with line graphs is typically when you get above you know, five or six lines in a single graph, it becomes pretty difficult to, to, to make valid interpretations. And what we're all about is giving you tools that let you make uh, interpretations of the data very, very quickly. So we invented something new. It's called the horizon graph. What it does is allows you to combine a number of time series uh, uh, data sets into a very small amount of vertical screen space. How they work is we take a single normal line graph 
and then we uh, color code it. We do that in uh, usually with three bands. You can actually select more bands if you want, but in most practice we find that three works very well. The, the bands closest to the baseline are the lightest color, and then we have a, a mid-range color uh, for the middle range of data, and then a very deep color for the very highest ranges of data or the very lowest ranges of data. As you can see, we're also coding the positive numbers as blue and the negative numbers as red. And then next, we invert the line. So now we've basically cut the amount of screen real estate, the vertical screen real estate, required to display this data in half. So again, the positive numbers are blue, the negative numbers are red. Then we take it a step further, and that is we collapse the line uh, on top of themselves. So we collapse those those uh, color zones on top of themselves. So now we can see in a very small amount of vertical screen real estate, the complete trace, we have all the data available, and we can see where the peaks are, where the, where the valleys are, and uh, we can get a very good idea of the trend here, but in a very small amount of vertical real estate. So let's look at a, a complete screen with a number of horizon graphs on it. Now we're looking at about 20 data sets here. We're looking at performance characteristics of different companies. These, this could be sales data or stock price data or profitability. And we can easily see in a, a single screen, uh, we got, what is it, a year, about a year's worth of data here. And we can see where the peaks and valleys are for each trace. We can also see correlations. We can see, for instance, that uh, Ross stores had a peak in about the middle of the time period. We can also see that Online Resources Corporation started to see peaks at about that same time period. Well, why is that? Maybe we want to investigate that further. Again, the whole idea here is to display data in a very efficient way that allows you to make interpretations of time series data when you want to compare a number of different data sets. You can find correlations and divergences quite easily. One of the very compelling and strong ports about Panopticon is the ability to analyze real-time data. By analyzing real-time data, what you can do is increase your response times and make proactive decisions rather than foreactive, uh, I'm sorry, rather than reactive decisions. You can foresee potential threats and identify opportunities as they arise, when they arise. Now, real-time data is processed through what we call a CEP, or a complex event processing engine. What a complex event processing engine does, it continues to feed data uh, as it happens. Uh, it has the ability to process multiple different data streams in real time. There's very low latent, latency, so you get sub-millisecond throughput. You get very high throughput. And this is all facilitated by the means of a CEP engine. So you have a variety of different message sending systems out there, whether those be market data feeds, your own application, and they all come in through an information bus that then feeds it to the CEP engine. Panopticon can sit on top of that CEP engine and feed that data in real time and display that real time. So it actually will show you that data and it will show you it as it moves from one stage to another. Without refreshing the screen, you'll actually see the data transform from one state to another. Now the CEP engine is different from your typical RDBMS or traditional database system. In your database system, what you do is you post that information to a database whether that's SQL Server, Oracle, or some other traditional row and column database, and then you read that data off that database. What a CEP engine does is it gets that information indirectly, and Panopticon reads it directly off that CEP engine. So you don't have that latency of writing it to a database and then reading it off that database. It takes the feed directly and displays it directly. Now that being in mind, Panopticon can also do what we call near real-time uh, feeds as well. So if you do have a traditional database and you want to use that as your data source because you're updating that at regular intervals, Panopticon can sit on top of that and do the same type of interactivity showing you that data as it happens. So with Panopticon and your CEP engine, what you end up getting is very real-time data and real-time data display fast comprehension, which means you can take fast action on that data. You Combining that with time series and real-time systems, real-time streams, you can very quickly see what's happening and make proactive decisions. 
You can connect to your typical rolling column oriented databases, which we call near real time, and get the same type of effect. And it's very easy to deploy, very rapid deployment, as we'll show you throughout the demo. So now I'd like to turn it over to David Fretwell, CEO of ZY Solutions, for the product demonstration. Thanks, Tom. I appreciate it. The goal here is, is to give you a feel for uh, how Panopticon can be used to visualize large amounts of data and perform analysis on that data, as opposed to using something like Excel, which makes it difficult to look at large amounts of data and, and really make, uh, make sense uh, of what is there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over here to Panopticon. Now, as uh, Hugh mentioned earlier, this is Panopticon EX. I'm using the designer application. There's also a, a viewer application. You'll find that the tool is very intuitive. This demo, I think, will show how easy it is to pull data into the tool, visualize it, and then use it for analysis. You're going to find that the menus are uh, very similar to Microsoft Office layouts, so it's easy for Office users to pick up on the use of this tool fairly quickly. There are three main areas here uh, that I'm going to show you at the moment. We've got a published area, uh, which shows workbooks that can be found after they've been published to the server, and you can access them through the web. And we do use the concept of workbooks as the main repository. So what you're seeing here, these are a number of published workbooks that are up on the web. We have a local area, which are workbooks that I've created and have stored locally on my computer, but I have not yet published them to the server and made them accessible to others. And then we also have a number of examples in the third section here. These are pre-built examples that ship with the product, and this will help in identifying best practice workbook design, give you some advice and help when you're trying to um, build uh, dashboards or uh, whatever it is that you want to be able to show using this tool uh, and create the different workbooks. Now on the left-hand side, I've got two major tabs here. I've got a parts tab and a data table tab. The parts tab here shows you uh, all of the um, out-of-the-box visualizations, tools and filters, and et cetera. So your typical bar graphs, horizon graphs, heat matrices, shapes, tree maps, what have you. These all indicate the various visualizations that are available. I've got a number of tools uh, that I could use for filters or for legends and some other general components as well. Then, of course, I have the data table, which is where we're going to identify the data that's been imported into the product that we can use with the um, associated uh, tools that are on the parts tab. What I'd like to show you here is a quick example. This, this is an Excel file. and now I'm actually going to use this Excel file as part of the demo here today. But what we've got is, I don't know, maybe 20 some columns. We've got uh, a little over 1,700 rows in this data. And this is stock information. And I've got things such as region and country. I've got a stock name and the ticker symbol that goes with it. I've got more hierarchical information, such as industry and super sector. Uh, then I've got numerical data. I've got one day change, one week change, two weeks, one, two, and three month changes. I also have market capitalization in US dollars and in local currency and the latest close price. And the, the, the point of this is when you're trying to get a lot of data and analyze lots of information on the screen at one time, this is really very, very difficult to do. So some of the things that you could do are you could uh, color code the various cells, but that's really just binary. It's going to give you, you know, an indication is it performing well, is it performing poorly. It's not really going to give you much as far as what the trend is. Uh, you could create pivot tables, but you lose, you know, you'll, you'll end up losing some of the underlying detail when you do that. Or you could use Panopticon and visualize the data in Panopticon, and uh, and that's what we're going to do now. So let me go back over here, to Panopticon. And I'm going to create a new workbook. This is just a blank slate. So I've started my new dashboard. I can actually have multiple tabs here. So we can have one workbook with one, two, five, eight dashboards, whatever it is that you want to have. I'm just going to deal with one here today. And this clean slate is going to give me the basis upon which I do my analysis. Now, of course, I need data. So I'm going to open a data table. And here's where I can select from the various uh, sources. I can choose from a variety of different databases. I can pull things directly in from uh, MQ uh, data bus. I can bring in um, the CEP engine data or Excel, which is you know, very powerful if you've just got an ad hoc Excel, Excel spreadsheet that you need to deal with. 
So here's stock static 02, that data file that I was showing you just a moment ago. Now I could, if I wanted to, enable real-time processing, but I'm not updating this, so I'm not going to uh, enable that at this time. And what this shows us is a snapshot of that data. It brings back and displays the first 10 rows, and you'll see all the headings that we saw in the Excel spreadsheet just a moment ago. And if I scroll over to the right, you'll be able to see you know, what we have here. Now, this gives us the basis upon which I want to, uh, to do my analysis, but there's some things that I probably want to change here. And I can go into settings. This lists all the, the various fields that are available to me. And I've got some of these fields that are really percentages. And so instead of displaying the raw, raw numerical data, I'd like to change these to percentages to make them a little bit easier to read uh, when I start doing my analysis, because I'll see that some of these uh, get used in some of the pop-up windows, and this just makes it easier to find you know, what you want to do with it. And I also want to um, create a field I want to enhance this cube with something that's not in the cube at the moment, so I can create a new calculated field. And what I'm going to create is a field called Outstanding Shares. And I'm going to create that by dividing uh, market cap divided by my close. And now you can see I've added a new field that shows up over here on the right-hand side of your screen called outstanding shares. So this allowed me to very quickly and easily enhance this cube by adding a new column to that cube. So what I've done here, and uh, I'm what maybe five minutes into this, I've been able to identify a data source. I've been able to bring that into uh, my in-memory OLAP cube, which is what Panopticon refers to as a stream cube. And now at this point, I can begin uh, visualizing it. Now, of course, before I do that, I need to save this in my workbook. So now I can go back over here to my, um, my dashboard and, and start doing the things that I want to do. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to create a tree map. So I go over to my parts table, my parts tab, I should say, and I bring in a, uh, a tree map tool. And I want to size it so that you can probably see this well enough. When I select my data and identify the data table that I'm looking for, right now I can start bringing in specific data that I can uh, make visible with this. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to start off by bringing in some specific fields out of my data and drag them right onto my uh, tree map that I've just created. So I'm going to start with super sector. I'm going to bring in industry. Uh, let's see, I probably want to use region and country. And uh, let's add name as well. So now at this point, I've got a number of elements on here. And you can see that we've got you know, a, a matrix, uh, but it doesn't really show you a whole lot that, uh, that, that really is, is meaningful to you. So now what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to identify some other fields that I want to bring into these. So let's see. Let's bring market cap in and identify size with that. So now by doing this, what I can tell here is uh, Johnson & Johnson is the largest market cap in the healthcare sector, and ExxonMobil has the largest market capitalization in oil and gas. So now we've got a basic tree map that's been broken down by super sector. Uh, still not a whole lot you can do with it, but you know there's, there's some more visualizations that we want, want to bring into this thing. So Let's look at other ways that we can identify this. So I'm going to bring in my one-day change, and I'm going to drag that to my color box because that's a good way of visualizing this data. And now, all of a sudden, we're starting to see a lot more that we can do. Now, I'm going to bring some more in here just to give you an idea of, of how some of these drop-down boxes can be used. And then once I've done this, we're going to start doing a little bit of manipulation of this data. Uh, while you're yes, doing you. that, uh, Dave, I want to uh, mention uh, a couple things. One is typically in a tree map, and, and this same kind of principle applies to uh, other visualizations, but a tree map is particularly useful for looking at static data sets uh, like this. And uh, what you're doing in the breakdown is you're, you're, you're defining things by categories. So in this case, they've set up super sector, industry, region, country, and name. Those are different categories that the individual companies fall into. 
So then you have a hierarchy. So in the case, uh, the way it has it set up right now, healthcare is a super sector, and then there's a, an industry called healthcare as well, and then there's the regions, North America, Europe, and so forth, and then countries below that, and then the in individual companies below that. It's pretty easy to see that. The size is coded for a quantitative value. In this case, market cap. It's, it's something that indicates importance, usually. So if you were looking at, say, network traffic in a telecoms application, it might be the amount of traffic. And then typically, in a, uh, for the color in a tree map, you use some kind of qualitative measure. Now, in this case, it's a, it's a, it's a number as well. It's a percentage change, but it's something that's going to uh, flag your eye you know, to tell you, OK, there's something going uh, well or poorly here. In this case, we're using color to encode for a one-day change in a stock price. And red is bad, and green is error. Sorry, the blue is is good. So you have the categorical breakdown. That's the uh, the, the breakdown. That's the uh, hierarchy of the data. You have the a quantitative factor, typically indicating importance, that's encoded for size, and then you have a qualitative factor. In this case, we're using one-day change or some other factors that will that uh, he's going to show. But they will encode for color then. So we'll encode color for a qualitative factor. So what I'd like to do now, I'm going to bring over something to tell me a little bit more about what this information means. So I have a series of legends and filters that I can bring in. So I'm going to drag my numeric color legend onto my dashboard. And of course, I need to connect that to my data. And now what I've done is th this, the process of connecting this color legend to the data automatically populates this legend to two standard deviations from the mean. Now I can change the boundaries to an absolute or to a percentage figure. But this basically tells me at the darkest end of the spectrum, I'm finding that uh, some of these uh, stocks are down by approximately 7.2%. And at the highest end of the spectrum, it's approximately 7.2% 7 7 there as well. I can also do a number of things such as filters. This is where we can start taking a large amount of data and identifying uh, those bits and pieces that we really want to interact with and want to know a little bit more about. So I start by dragging uh, this, this filter box on, but uh, I need to identify some specific filters that I want to bring into this. So uh, let's say I'm going to bring in uh, my market capitalization. So I'm going to go back over to my data table. Let's bring market cap over and take a look at that. Let's bring my one day change percent. I want to take a look at that as well. Um, and I've got you now regions a different kind of filter. I'll use this kind of as a drop down box. Now these filters allow me to start doing some things right away. So if I look at market capitalization, for instance, I'm able to see that most of them are very small. Uh, you know, towards the smaller end of the scale, I've got uh, a tail here and then a very few of them at the high end. So if I can drag this handle over to about this point, all of a sudden I'm looking at approximately the top 10 market capitalized stocks that are in my overall portfolio, and I can see how they're doing. I can see ExxonMobil, I can see IBM, I can see AT&T, and this allows me to use this to identify a small subset of, of stocks as opposed to having to look at the large uh, population. Now you'll also notice that if I look at uh, the, the one day change, we've got this large cluster in the middle and you would kind of expect that over the course of a single day, you're gonna see very small changes with most stocks, but you're gonna have some outliers. Uh, you're gonna have some that may change at a higher rate. We've got some that are up 21.08%. Uh, I've got some that are down by 35%. So I really want to deal with those exceptions. By dragging these handles, I'm able to uh, start looking at the exceptions rather than that uh, group in the middle. And of course, you're seeing the ones that have the greatest upward swing or the greatest downward swing. And of course, I can combine multiples of these fi filters and if you find that you know, all of a sudden I brought two filters together and there's no data to show, it tells me right now. So the point is I don't have to wait until I've applied six or seven or eight filters only to find out that it's not going to return any data for me. This gives me real-time feedback as to, uh, to what I'm looking at and what kind of results I'm going to be getting based on the actions that I'm taking. 
So these filters become very powerful tools. Now I also have the ability in any of these to uh, you know, select them through other means. So for example, if all I want to do is look at Asia Pacific, it's a very quick way of identifying that everything in the Asia Pacific area is down with uh, very few exceptions. I can take a, a look at Europe as a whole and find that uh, Europe overall is doing quite well with the exception of automobiles, insurance, and uh, and banking, uh, but that healthcare is doing quite well, as is retail and personal and household goods. And of course, I can combine multiples of these or switch to just one of them. And uh, so these filters become very uh, very effective tools to help me um, to help me manage all of that. I'm going to do one more thing, and I'm going to bring uh, back over here for my parts. I'm going to bring a table onto the screen. Drag that. Let's put that down here at the bottom. Let me resize this so that we can see the data that we're going to uh, want to see. And of course, it's very simple. I drag it. I connect to the data that I'm looking at. And now what I've done here in a matter of just uh, about one second is I've populated a table with about 60,000 data points with just a few mouse clicks in, in, uh, in about a second. Now this table, of course, is very interactive. I can sort this in different ways. I can uh, take a look at things by name. I can look at it by industry, by region, and, uh, and do my sorts in that manner and find what I'm looking at. And as I scroll down here, you'll see we've got a tremendous amount of data that's in this table in a very quick and easy way of, uh, of looking at this information. So now what I've done with about maybe another five minutes or so, I've created a dashboard from this large data set. And now I can start using this to do uh, some advanced analysis, and we can talk a little bit more about some of the key features. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go into presentation mode. I want to turn off the, um, the development widgets. Now, this is what your typical user would see by coming in and accessing the web. Uh, the um, all the design elements that you have to add data or to add some of the widgets, that's been removed. However, you still get the full filter functionality and the ability to interact with that workbook. While you can't alter the layout in this mode, you still have full interactivity with, uh, with the application. So I'm going to deal a little bit with uh, some of the hierarchies. Uh, Hugh said just a moment ago that there's different ways of identifying hierarchical relationships of the data. And of course, I identified how I wanted to look at this when I first uh, built this dashboard. So a couple things that I could do, for example, I could look at this and say, well, I want to move industry in front of super sector. And now what I'm doing, I'm, bank I'm grouping all of my financial information together, banks, insurance, financial services, and real estate. And then within that, of course, I've got region and country uh, embedded within that. So within insurance, you're going to see Europe, you're going to see North America, and inside North America is U.S., and you're going to see Asia Pacific. Now, I can turn this whole view on its ear by taking region and just dragging it over to the far left. And now instead of looking at things by industry and super sector, I'm looking at it by region of the world. And then within that, I can uh, start drilling into it. I can also move country around, which gets you just about the same type of a layout. But it's very easy to, to quickly... Uh, identify how you want to look at this information and, uh, and drag my pieces around left and right to visualize this in many different ways. Now I can also grab this handle and go to the high level. So I can start by saying, well, overall my portfolio is down by 2.24%. But that doesn't tell me a whole lot. We don't really know very much beyond that. We don't know why. But when I start opening this up, I start looking at the industries, and I can see, well, healthcare looks to be one, uh, actually the only one that's doing well at the moment. Well, I can peel this back a little bit farther and find that, um, well, in the consumer goods world, automobiles and parts are way down. And that, of course, is what's probably dragging most of my consumer goods activity down. Then I can start looking by regions and add that to it, country, and actually go down to the name of a specific individual security. So here I'm looking at General Electric, and I can see that GE is down by 6.22%. I can uh, go take a look at something else and find that um, uh, Japan overall 
in uh, basic materials is down. Now, I don't see enough detail here, so I can double click this and go into it. Now I've got a lot more information. I can start looking at specific stocks within this area. Nippon Steel, various stocks, and I'm popping up a bit of information about where I'm at. I can drill back up, go back up to the top from any point and take a look at what I want. I can start drilling down into other areas. So this tool makes it very easy to quickly identify where you've got some anomalies, quickly drill in to look at those anomalies and find out what is behind all of that. So in addition to all of this, what you're going to find is by, by dealing with these um, drill downs and my filters and what have you, um, I can change and start looking at, well, let me just show this by reason, region. I really only want to see the ones that have significant changes by region. All right, so I can see that, well, Asia Pacific is way down, North America is mixed, Europe is generally up. So let me drill in a little bit more just to Europe and I can see this. And then of course I can start drilling into uh, more details here at any point in time. So I can see information about Barclays specifically, Credit Agricole, a variety of different information here. So what I've done so far is I've showed you how we can take a very large complex data set that in and of itself with Excel really made very little sense or you could make very little sense out of that. We quickly imported this into an in-memory OLAP cube. We were able to build a dashboard. We've got two visualizations. We applied a handful of filters to that and now we've got the capabilities to do analysis of this data very quickly, very easily show the overall portfolio performance, identify problem areas, identify high performance areas, identify outliers, and allow us to make decisions much faster and much easier. We do have a question from uh, Zach, and he's asking uh, how uh, big uh, the database can be uh, connected to a Panopticon system. And I have, uh, I'd like to answer that one. Uh, essentially what Dave is showing here is a very simple data set. It's a, it's a static data set stored in a spreadsheet. Uh, there's, uh, you know, maybe there's a few thousand rows here and a few columns. Uh, in fact, in, in a practical application, you would never use it that way. Uh, most of the databases that we're connecting to have millions of rows. Uh, perhaps, um, you know, it could be hundreds of columns. And in addition, you can federate data from multiple sources into a single dashboard. So, and this is a fairly simplistic uh, example. Uh, we're not doing any real time work here, uh, but it could be. This data that you're looking at could be being updated in real time so that when you're looking at, say, the tree map that Dave had on the screen, if you could go back to the tree map, Dave, um, uh, you could be looking at the, the exact status of the data as it is right now. That is, if there's a real time feed that's, uh, that's uh, amplifying this and, and, and uh, uh, being connected to the dashboard, the data you would be seeing would be exactly what is happening right now. This could be true in a, in a supply chain management application, in a telco application, or in a, a financial application, wherever you need to see the most recent data. We also have a question from uh, Abby, and that's regarding the uh, deployment cycle. How long does it take to deploy a system like this? The tool is actually very easy to deploy in a very short amount of time. Uh, we have a number of clients that actually are up and operational and pulling valuable information out of this at the end of a day or two days. Um, the, the most lengthy time that uh, you're going to spend is identifying and getting connected to your data sources and being able to understand what some of those more complex data sources are. Uh, but the, the installation process, have that done in, in, in the matter of an hour. And if you're looking at a couple of basic data sources by the end of the first day, you should be able to have some uh, immediate value that you're pulling out of the tool. Okay, excellent. We have a question from Norito, and this is a, a follow-up to the first question from uh, Zach. And it's, uh, you talk about real-time sources. Uh, how fast can the data be updated? I'll take that one. The, the data model is an in-memory data model, and it, it will support uh, data updates up to several hundred thousand times per second. Uh, in reality, what you're going to display on the screen, you don't want a, a tree map that's vibrating with new uh, updates hundreds of thousands of times a second. That becomes very difficult to interpret. So 
we provide controls in the system that allow you to throttle that data, and it automatically does uh, conflation. So it will uh, take uh, all the changes that happen within a amount of time that you set and will create averages and then present those on the screen. So therefore, the data will be updated at the rate you choose. The data model can handle uh, it basically as fast as you want it to be, but the human psychovisual system can't. You can only perceive so many changes uh, in real time on the screen. So uh, we give you the controls to allow you to, to change that uh, interval, how often the screen is updated, and uh, the data model is taking the data in as fast as it comes in through the message bus or through a CEP engine, and, and then is presenting it based on the throttled level that you've chosen in the deployment. And let's take a couple more and then move on. We have a question from Ewan, and this is, I don't have a, a staff to, to implement something like this. Uh, does Panopticon provide uh, consulting services that can help me uh, implement something like this in my facility? Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, the the answer is yes uh, through two different um, through two different avenues. Panopticon does have a group of uh, professional services resources that are available. Uh, Panopticon also relies very heavily on um, and works very closely with implementation partners such as ZY Solutions. Uh, so our team of um, experts here can help you with the implementation, uh, either on-site or remotely, to uh, to help you implement this, get up to speed, do knowledge transfer, so that you're very quickly up and operational and uh, don't necessarily have to rely either on an IT staff or on someone um, being there with you day to day to keep the uh, keep the solution operational. As an extension to that, also uh, ZY Solutions can help you with the even the procurement of the hardware and the installation of the hardware as well. That uh, if you don't already have it in house, uh, we can actually uh, deliver to you a prepackaged, pre-installed machine already with Panopticon installed. All we need to do is connect it to your network and data sources. Okay, excellent. And let's take a question from uh, Eric here. And it's, uh, he's a, he says, uh, our firm is using business objects as its BI solution. Uh, would Panopticon be an appropriate tool to use with business objects? Or are there other BI systems that it's a better, better match with? We find a lot of customers are using our tools in conjunction with BI systems like business objects. They're, they're really different things. Business Objects is a great reporting system, and it allows you to do uh, really, really, um, you know, amazing things with very large amounts of data. It also even provides some graphical tools for presenting that data. But it's not an, uh, an analytical system in the same sense that Panopticon is. Again, this is more, this is not a presentation tool. This is an analytical tool. So what, 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 in any BI system, in order to use it effectively, you have to have a good idea of what questions you're trying to answer of the data. You have to understand the data well enough that you can say, okay, I want to know how many parts we shipped yesterday. I want to know how many failures we had yesterday in the routers, uh, things like that. I mean, these, these are very simple questions, but they're questions nonetheless that a BI system can answer, yeah, e even based on very complex data coming in from lots of different locations and so forth. What, what Panopticon does, and we've had a number of customers tell us this, is it helps you answer questions you didn't know you had. So by exploring the data, by interacting with the data, by, by manipulating the data, by using the, the filters that, that Dave had up on the screen, by, by finding outliers, you may find things that surprise you that weren't obvious. It's not such a question, it's not, it's not so much a matter of of uh, answering the questions, it's a matter of finding new questions that will help you, um, uh, make, you know, make better business decisions. So uh, what we can help you do is identify opportunities and problems very quickly and at the same time uh, get answers to those questions so that you can take appropriate action. And, and in, in today's environment, you know, time is money. It's, the time you save uh, can really be enormously beneficial to any organization. So it's, it's something that's often used in conjunction with BI systems. There, it doesn't replace the BI system. We're not a data warehouse. We're not a, we're not a system that uh, will uh, give you uh, the reporting capabilities that a business objects will do. What we do give you is online interactive analytical tools that will help you uh, understand, gain new insights, let's say, into the data. 
Yeah, thanks, Hugh. I think that's a great lead into right into uh, some of the use cases or uh, examples of how uh, organizations are actually using Panopticon, uh, including that are telecom and energy, uh, looking for things like network performance, fraud monitoring, uh, analysis of different uh, assets such as oils and gas, um, and uh, doing projected uh, performance monitoring, profit analysis, capacity analysis. And one is an example is uh, a client, Polystar. Uh, Polystar had challenges in monitoring performance at the national level, uh, a variety over a variety of telecommunication networks. And uh, they had massive amounts of data that they just couldn't handle a consistently, uh, needed some way to consistently look at that data and it was in a very high volume changing databases. So their solution was to create a new crystallizer module. Uh, they white labeled Panopticon in their web deployment solution and had seamless integration with no programming whatsoever. So it was a value add that they gave to their customers so they could make more efficient use of the network capacity by answering questions that the customers didn't even know they had. And uh, it was a very easy to explain benefit for uh, sales to go out and close new business. So it gave them a very highly competitive advantage over their uh, competitors. Also in consumer brands and retailing, uh, different things like uh, inventory analysis, out-of-stock analysis, store revenue analysis, and just general sales performance monitoring and client and product profitability. Uh, one example there is a global consumer in packaged goods, not to be named, um, who had challenges in a global deployment, had very large investment in legacy BI systems. Uh, as you mentioned, like business objects could be one of those, uh, OBIE. Um, and they had managers that needed to make business critical decisions, but just didn't have the time to weed through these vast amounts of data. Uh, they need to do that to reduce and eliminate costly mistakes that they were making. So their solution was integrate Panopticon into their current BI infrastructure, uh, where tree maps were very critical, and all the development was done by internal business users. The end result was they made less mistakes, they spent less time making and analyzing data, and they had more time for other priority projects, and they were ended up being very proactive in their decision making rather than reactive. Another industry is such as David demoed was the financial services industry, uh, pre-sale, post-trade, pre-trade, um, client and product performance, risk analysis, um, all are things that uh, we do quite often within Panopticon, as well as the data visualization that David showed you quite extensively in the demo. Uh, there, J.P. Morgan was one of the clients that uh, utilized it. They had challenges in just differentiating their service from their competitors, uh, trying to help clients reduce the information overload and spot opportunities more easily in a very user configurable environment. They did this by utilizing custom development through the Panopticon Developer SDK and added tree map visualizations to their existing website. So it was very easy to deploy this for JP Morgan into their existing website and their end users didn't really know there was another product involved there, and it made it look like just part of the whole J.P. Morgan solution. It ended up being very fast and efficient for them to implement this and improve their customer retention rate because they had something to offer that other competitors just didn't have. And it ended up giving their, some, them some really enhanced market awareness because of the tool that they provided to their end users. Of course, government and other industries are another good place for Panopticon. Uh, when you start to do uh, geographical uh, analysis, performance monitoring, maintenance monitoring, uh, any kind of sales or demographic analysis, excellent tool for doing those types of things. Uh, Dell Tech was one example of that. They had challenges of quickly identifying the problems, uh, looking through thousands of variables and multiple projects, and their traditional reports and spreadsheets were limited. And as you've seen, just looking at traditional reports and spreadsheets, you're getting into information overload. So their solution was create a new visual business, uh, visual business intelligence module using the Panopticon Developer SDK. It was a very short, low-risk development effort. Uh, the end result was they actually dramatically increased sales. 
uh, ending up with uh, 80% of customers uh, uh, buying through the visualization module as a tool for sales. Uh, it definitely improved the competitive pr position, and it just made them very unique in the industry. When clients went out and looked at solutions, Dell Tech became the solution because of uh, their unique way of developing or delivering information to the end user. So if we look at the entire value proposition, what Panopticon brings to the table is the ability to deploy in hours uh, a tool, be able to train your end users in a matter of minutes because of its very easy, intuitive user interface. Uh, it can handle fast-changing database or CEP engine feeds uh, or re near real-time to your traditional databases. And as you saw through the demo, it's very easy to design those dashboards very quickly for an end user, a non-IT type of person. And then once you design those dashboards, it's very easy just with one click to publish those dashboards to the web for everyone else to use. Uh, it delivers a very easy and comprehensive interpretation of the data now. So instead of looking through and weeding through those rows and rows and columns of data, you end up with a very simple user interface where you can monitor in a glance and analyze in seconds your data. Okay. Uh, it's very flexible in your deployment. You could use the full Panopticon EX desktop or you could deploy it through the web. Um, you have the ability to access your traditional role and column oriented databases or you can get it through a CEP engine near real time. And you could federate these multiple data sources, meaning that you can bring data from a variety of different data sources all into one uh, Panopticon dashboard. Yeah, we do have some more questions. Uh, this question comes from Joanna. Uh, can this system be used to analyze clickstream data coming in at real time from web applications? Yes, it can. Uh, in fact, we do have clients that are using that. Uh, the beauty of using a CEP engine in that case um, can often bring uh, data from multiple web-based applications in through a single source, and this can show you what's happening real time through your websites. Uh, for, or for situations such as um, uh, promotions um, that you've put up on the website and the uh, performing analysis on the traffic coming in uh, based on those promotions. Okay, good. And we have a question from Andrew. Uh, and that is, can I use this with a column-oriented database? So we're using column-oriented. He says, well, I'll explain. Uh, column-oriented databases are uh, special types of databases that are typically much more responsive uh, in, in pulling queries than traditional row-oriented databases. So SQL Server, Oracle, DB2, these are row-oriented databases. Column-oriented databases, a popular one is uh, Sybase IQ. Uh, they are able to pull data much faster. Uh, there, there's pros and cons to each one, and that's why they both exist in the market, but uh, 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 column-oriented databases are typically a lot faster. And the question is, can I use this with a column-oriented database? And the answer is yes, absolutely. Yeah, and in fact, uh, I can tell you we, we have a number of customers that are doing just that. It's a, it's a real popular use. Again, it kind of ties nicely into the real-time aspects of the system. It can handle the very fast updates that uh, are available from a, a column-oriented database. Um, we have a question from Sarah, and um, how is this different? How is Panopticon different than the dashboard tools that we're already using? And we're using, uh, and, and she refers to Dundas as a, as a dashboard tool they, they have in their company. How is this? How what really makes this different? I'd say the biggest difference is this is focused more on. Um, visualizing and analyzing data in a uh, real-time, more interactive manner. A lot of dashboard tools uh, that are on the market often will take a look at historical information and tell you what's been happening in the past, but don't necessarily give you the ability to interact with that data, drill into it, and find answers uh, faster uh, than you can when you're dealing with um, uh, with your, your typical dashboard. That's one of the beauties of, uh, of using Panopticon is to be able to deal uh, from that uh, and perform that lean forward analysis that you want to do. Okay, good. And we have time. We'll take uh, two more quick questions here. We have a, a question from David. Um, what if 
you don't have one of the visualizations I need in my particular application. Can I add new visualizations to the system? Uh, let, let me answer that one. Uh, yes, you can. Uh, we have a plug-in architecture in the, in the product. This applies to EX and the SDK and also the Rapid Development Kit. And you can add new visualizations yourself to a, a wrapper component we offer, or we can build them for you and, and wrap them for you and, and make them available. Uh, so yes, it is possible. Additionally, we're always adding new visualizations to the system. So every major release, we have a number of new visualizations that we add. So uh, what we have today is not not the limitation. If you need additional visualizations or uh, have particular requirements based on your industry or, or uh, particular use case, uh, we can certainly help you with that as well. And then this will be the last question, and this is from UKA. And uh, the question is, uh, can you tell me more about CEP engines uh, and how they work and, and what they are? And, and that's getting a little bit out of scope uh, from, from what we offer, but uh, I'll take a, a shot at answering that. Uh, CEP engines are a new technology. It's an emerging technology that's uh, become quite popular in particular sectors, including uh, telecoms and uh, financial services. And essentially what a CEP engine does is allows you to program business logic into a, a middle layer of software that will take um, uh, will take real time feeds and and allow you to um, apply algorithms to those feeds of various types and it'll do that with very very low latency and then it'll output a new real time feed. It can also reference historical data like uh, in a in a uh, in a telco application, for instance, you might have uh, historical data regarding uh, uh, call traffic uh, from uh, that's coming in from routers, and that, that could be billions of rows of data stored, say, in a column or a database. Well, you can make correlations between, say, long-term averages and short-term averages and medians and so forth, uh, compare that to real-time data, and make uh, new outputs uh, based on business logic that you've programmed in the CEP engine, and that will then output a real-time stream of that uh, correlated and processed data. So uh, uh, it's, a, it's a new technology. It's, uh, it's for very high performance systems and it's something that uh, particularly in, in fields where you need uh, to make decisions based on uh, um, data that's changing very frequently, uh, it's, it's, very, it's very useful technology. So it's, a, it's an important building block in a lot of uh, complete systems now, that's not what Panopticon does, but we do allow you to visualize and interpret the data coming out of the CEP engine. Yeah, and Hugh, I'd, I'd also like to mention, we, we, we do find a lot of synergies between CEP engines and Panopticon, um, which is one of the things that I think really differentiates Panopticon in the marketplace, being able to do what it does. And when you couple that with a CEP engine, and, and uh, ZY Solutions is also a uh, Sybase partner, and, and so for example, O'Leary or the, or the various CEP solutions from Sybase coupled with Panopticon um, do a good job of helping you deal with that data uh, and visualize it using the Panopticon solution. That's exactly right. Thank you all for attending. We appreciate your interest. If you want to contact us, our contact information is there on the, um, on the screen. If you have any questions, please feel free to call us or go to uh, the website. Go to either uh, zysolutions.com or panopticon.com, and you can uh, get uh, uh, all the details you'd like. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, thank you, Tom and Dave. Thanks, everybody.